I want you to look at these two lines. Let's call them line A and line B. Now, which line is longer? Okay, I'll drop the whole Dora act. Without question, line A is the answer. Would you, however, change your answer if everyone around you answered with line B? You may be inclined to say, no, that will be ridiculous, but hold your horses. Today, we're talking about social pressure and the fear of failure. This is going to be a chunky mental ration, so get your favorite cutlery and join me. Why are my catchphrases always so cringe? In what has become one of the most seminal studies in psychology, Solomon Ash presented a similar line task to his participants. The twist? He had paid off a bunch of other people to give the wrong answer first. When it came to the true participants' turn, 75% of them went along with it and gave the wrong answer as well. After the experiment was over and they were all told how they got duped, some explained that they answered this way because they didn't want to be seen as weird by the rest, while some others said they had genuinely began to doubt their own answers. If people conform with something as obvious as the length of the lines, imagine what would happen with questions that have less obvious answers. Imagine how much you doubt yourself with more complex questions. Interestingly, Ash conducted other variations of this study. When just one of the fake participants actually gave the correct answer, the degree of conformity of true participants dropped by over six times. It looks like all we need sometimes is a little bit of validation. Now, this might be a cool study to bring up at parties and stuff, because that's what people do at parties, right? Yeah, I have a social life. But in the absence of someone to help us see our errors, our tendency to conform can be very damaging. In the now infamous Milgram obedience studies, Jewish psychologist Stanley Milgram wanted to examine whether average people could obey an authority to the extent that they could commit atrocities similar to the ones the Nazis committed, for example, killing another human being. His experiments, conducted just 15 years after the end of World War II, unfortunately gave a resounding yes. Milgram's experiment brought in a fake participant who was in on the trick and a true participant. One would be the teacher and the other the learner. Of course, the draw was rigged. The true participant was always the teacher. His job was to quiz the learner. With every wrong answer, the teacher had to deliver an electric shock to the learner who was supposedly strapped to a chair in another room through a remote machine and increase the voltage by 15 volts up to a maximum of 450. Of course, once the teacher witnessed the learner being tied down and left the room, the learner was set free. The learner was instructed to get quite a few questions wrong, at which point the teacher had to shock him, then increase the voltage. Pre-recorded voice lines indicated that the learner was suffering. At high enough voltages, the voice lines begged the teacher to stop, before banging on the wall and eventually falling into complete silence. If teachers hesitated to continue the shocks, the experimenter would prompt them to continue. Keep in mind, the teacher thought they were shocking an actual person. Even with this knowledge, a staggering two in three participants reached the point of delivering a shock of 450 volts. Much, much less is needed to actually kill a person. Let me stress that, if this was a real setting, the participants would have listened to the experimenter to the point where they would kill another human being. Gets you thinking. If Milgram were alive today, he'd probably have a prank channel on YouTube. So what, participants traumatized for life? It's a prank, bro! Troublingly, more recent research suggests that this would happen even today. But yet again, variations of this experiment showed that when there was another teacher who refused to shock the learner, the participant took inspiration from that and was less likely to continue with the shocks. Now, what does all this say about your approach to risk and failure? From what we've said so far, it's quite clear that we're actually quite prone to do the wrong thing when others are doing it too. Be that a factual or a moral error. If one person steps up and does what's right, we're likely to follow. But why is this? Well, it boils down to one thing. A fear of responsibility. I mean, who's going to take the responsibility if anything happens to that gentleman? I'm responsible for anything that happens here. Continue, please. All right, next one. Slow. Wrong. Answer his neck. 300 volts. 
Now, sure, you'll say I'd kill someone because I'm scared of taking responsibility, dude. What? Just, just, okay. I'm getting there. Introducing the bystander effect. Most people would consider themselves pretty helpful, but actually, when someone is in need and many people are around to help, most of them would say, why me? And so nobody would end up helping. This phenomenon received a lot of attention following the Kitty Genovese case. In 1964, Kitty was assaulted in an alley where she shouted for about 30 minutes. Although she was allegedly hurt by over 30 nearby residents, almost nobody called the police. She died shortly after by stab wounds. So funnily enough, the very case that gave rise to the bystander effect wasn't even a case of the bystander effect itself. Kitty did receive help the night she died, but the New York Times misreported this. Still, this was enough to garner psychologists' attention who began to study the effect and later showed it to be true in experimental settings. If there are others who can take the responsibility instead, we tend to avoid it. However, if we're the only ones around who can help, the responsibility falls on us alone, so we'll take it. Similarly, in cases of obedience, we can lie the responsibility on the person of authority. In cases of conformity, like the ASH studies, if we disagree, we're essentially sticking our necks out. Crucially, another factor which seems to play a major role in why people would ignore someone in need is a fear of embarrassment. Fearing that you may have misunderstood the situation and overreacted in your effort to help often outweighs the potential life-saving benefit that you could provide if the situation is truly an emergency. We humans are pretty funny. Things like conforming to doing bad things even though we know they're wrong or not helping people out of fear of being embarrassed are not unique to you or me. They exist in almost everyone. And this is what causes pluralistic ignorance. Picture the following scenario. Someone has just fallen off their bicycle in a busy square. They're in evident pain, but are not calling anyone for help. You, passing by that person, think to yourself, maybe I should help. You look around to pick up a cue. Everyone seems to just glance at the bicyclist, but walk past. So you think that the socially acceptable thing to do here is carry on with your day. You don't want to embarrass yourself by overreacting. Unbeknownst to you, everybody else is also thinking I should probably help. But they too look around and see nobody helping. So they also carry on with their day, thinking that everyone else believes this is a very trivial injury. Pluralistic ignorance is when you think the same thing as everyone else, but everyone thinks that everyone else thinks something different. That's a bit metal, I'll give you a moment to process that. It takes just one person to break this perceived norm and rise above their fear of embarrassment or accountability to help the person in need. Then, one by one, others will start to follow. Okay, but still, what does this have to do with why I'm afraid of failure? Well, as we've already said, the norms we think apply to a given situation are a huge reason of why people conform to giving evidently wrong answers or taking actions that could even be lethal to others. Norms are very powerful in making us second guess whether we should stand out. But despite being so incredibly powerful in guiding our behavior, just because something appears to be the norm does not mean it is the factually or morally correct thing to do. So why do we do it anyway? Being afraid of embarrassment or responsibility is one thing, but there's also the real star of the show. The spotlight effect. You can think of the spotlight effect as a metaphorical spotlight following you around your entire life. If you do something praiseworthy, you expect everyone to take notice and send their congratulations and applause, maybe some food if they know me well. But importantly, if you do something embarrassing or something that might put you, well, on the spot, you will think that everybody noticed it, everyone will remember it forever, your career is doomed and you are suddenly the most embarrassing thing about humanity. I'll give you a thought experiment. Think back to something embarrassing you did once. Really dig into that cringe. Good. Now ask yourself how embarrassing you thought it was and how often you find yourself thinking about that particular event. Now think about something embarrassing that someone else did. It could be a friend or a stranger on the street, anyone. How embarrassed do you think that person felt? How often do you think about that event instead? 
you will probably find that you think about your own embarrassments way more than you think about other people's if you even notice them to begin with. How easy was it to recall your own embarrassment compared to someone else's? A good rule of thumb when thinking about your failures is this. Other people care as much about your own failures as you care about theirs. And that's pretty much not at all. As irrational as it is, the spotlight effect keeps us from being a bit more carefree about the way in which we approach risk. It's wired in us to protect us from becoming complacent, sure, but like all biases, its effect is often exaggerated when it shouldn't be. For example, if you say something that's slightly wrong in a class and you get corrected, you might feel like you want the earth to open up and swallow you, but I can guarantee you that nobody else will bat an eye. Half the class won't even know what's going on. Becky's probably shopping on Amazon and Charlie's watching the highlights from last night's game. Would you care if someone else got corrected? See? The spotlight effect leads nicely, it's not really nice, into something called the focusing illusion. I can't define it better than the man who coined the term himself, Daniel Kahneman. Nothing in life is as important as you think it is while you are thinking about it. For example, people may generally be pretty satisfied with their lives, but if you first ask them about how happy they are with their bodies and then ask them about their life satisfaction, People who don't like the way they look will also tell you they're generally unhappy. If you focus on the potential failure of anything you want to do and the subsequent embarrassment this may cause, you will make it much more salient than it should be. If you think it's dumb that people would measure their life satisfaction based on how they think they look, guess what? It's pretty dumb to quit before starting because you think you're gonna fail. There, I said it, all right? Sue me. Actually, don't, please. I'm, I'm, I'm broke. So to round up. I need a bigger space. Ah. The spotlight effect and the focusing illusion often work together in unison to put us off from making decisions that could play out really well for us, whether that's a career decision, asking for a favor, or just picking up a hobby you've wanted to do for a while. When making decisions, you're likely to overthink every possible scenario, many of which will evoke embarrassing past mistakes. The spotlight effect will see to it that you're blowing this embarrassing moment out of proportion, thinking that it had a much bigger influence than it actually had. Once you've primed yourself with this, the focusing illusion kicks in. You think that everything revolves around this one thing you might not be particularly good at, or that this one embarrassing moment has forever ruined your prospects of ever becoming a contributing member of society, but it hasn't. People probably don't even remember it. Relax. Realistically, the biggest danger you're facing is criticism, and ultimately, that's why you're afraid to stick your neck out. But actually, criticism, for all its bad connotations, just makes you more efficient. Why spend a thousand years perfecting something when you could just let others tell you what you could work on improving? Mistakes aren't the end of the world, they're your most efficient and valuable way of getting better. Unless your mistake is accidentally blowing up a building or something, don't do that. That's not to say that you will be met with criticism, it's just even if you are, your worst case scenario is actually a good thing. Turn off that spotlight. When it comes to the things you're passionate about, be that one person that stands up and breaks the norm. One by one, others will follow. Basically, I've just spent 15 minutes trying to tell you what a great philosopher once said. Just do it! I watering. So that thing you've been meaning to do, go do it. Do it now. And let me know what you're gonna do in the comments. Also, like this video, subscribe, and turn on the notification bell. As always, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.